So now we've developed a set of mathematical tools. We have everything we need to derive one of the most important equations in all of physics, and that is the wave equation, whose solutions are functions which describe waves. Now the way we're going to do it in this video is a little bit backwards from the standard method and the reason for that is that if you're going to do it in the proper method uh, that derives it in a general sense and then solves it in a general sense, you need to have a little bit more knowledge of partial differentials than we have. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with our simple oscillator with a phase offset and consider what happens if that phase offset varies as a function of position, which is exactly what happens in a wave. So here we have a wave, and what I've done is I've taken a snapshot of the wave, and we'll call that at time t equals zero. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing the displacements of the oscillators which make up the wave as a function of their position x. And if I take one of these oscillators, and we say that the displacement, displacement from the equilibrium position here is psi, then it's a simple harmonic oscillator, and I can write down that the function of psi with respect to time, because of course it's going to vary with time, is equal to the amplitude a times the cosine of omega t, where omega is the angular frequency, and then I'm going to have an initial phase psi. Now if I look at all of these oscillators, we can see that the initial phase is not the same for all oscillators. This is all the oscillators in the wave taken at time t equals zero, and they all have different displacements. So this now, psi, is not a constant, it's going to be a function of x. So psi now is a function of x because as I vary the position here, I get a different initial phase. So the question is now, what sort of function of x are we talking about? Well, if this wave is moving in the positive x direction, then what is going to happen at some later point is that you know, this uh, oscillator here is going to move up, and I'm going to have it here at some later point. So the phase at this point here is behind the phase here. So as I move in this direction, my uh, phase offset psi is going to have to decrease because as I increase my value of x, uh, psi uh, you know, the, the psi is further behind in phase because as time increases, you know, this um, oscillator here will move up to this point. And so at some later point, this oscillator will reach the same phase that this oscillator is at for a, move, for a wave that's moving in the positive x direction. So this means that as I go to larger and larger values of x, uh, I'm, my, my psi should get smaller and smaller. So what I'm going to want to have here is I'm going to want to have a minus sign in front of it. Now the next thing we're going to assume is that if I look at this point here, at the wave crest, and I look at this point here, when I move from this point to this point here, I've gone through a phase change of 2 pi radians, because I've started at this uh, point here, I've ended up at a point with uh, the same phase because it's at the maximum uh, uh, top of the wave crest, so it's the equivalent phase, I should say, and so that means I've gone through a phase change of 2 pi, that's you know equivalent to one cycle. And by definition, the distance between two points with the same equivalent phases is, in fact, lambda, the wavelength. So what we're going to assume is that the change in phase between adjacent oscillators is the same each time. So if I go from this oscillator to this oscillator, or this one to this one, this one to this one, and so on, I have the same phase change between each oscillator, which means I get a linear change in phase. And so I can write down this function psi as 2 pi over lambda times x, because after I, when x is equal to lambda, in other words, I've moved through a distance of one wavelength, then I've ended up with a phase change of 2 pi. 
uh, or I should say I've gone backwards in phase by a factor of 2 pi because the wave is moving in the positive x direction. And then finally, I'm going to uh, include a constant phase, and here we'll use phi. The reason for that is that, of course, this wave could be shifted anywhere along here, and I want a general function that's going to work for any wave, not one particular wave. And so I've got to allow for, the, you know, at time t equals 0, I could have a wave crest at the origin instead of a, um, you know, a, a oscillator at equilibrium. So this is my function, but if I look at this, I can simplify it a little bit further because 2 pi over lambda is just the wave number k, and so I can write this as minus kx minus phi, and then when I put this into my uh, function for the displacement, I've now got a function of x and time, and that is going to be equal to a cosine, and now what I've got is I've got omega t minus kx minus phi. So this is the expression for a wave that is traveling in the positive x direction. And we got that with a little bit of hand waving, but we have got a function. Now one of the things to note with this before we're done with it is that cosine is a symmetric function. So the cosine of theta is equal to the cosine of minus theta. So I'm going to reverse the signs here and I can write this as psi of x and t is equal to a times the cosine and now I've got kx minus omega t um, plus phi. So this is the way we're going to typically write it uh, in the positive x for a wave in the positive x direction. However, it is possible to have it written this way as well. So you can have omega t minus kx or kx minus omega t. It doesn't make any difference as long as the two signs are, are opposite for omega t and kx. You'll have a wave traveling in the positive x direction, and the sign of the constant phase offset, of course, is is irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether that's positive or negative. So that's for a wave in the positive x direction. What about for a wave traveling in the negative x direction? So here we have a wave now, but in this case, the wave is now traveling in the negative x direction. So when we make the same argument, you know, this is at, at time t equals 0, we've got different initial phases for the oscillators as a function of the position x. But the crucial point now is, is that as the wave moves this way, this uh, oscillator here is going to move up and uh, become the wave crest of the future, which means that this uh, oscillator here is actually uh, behind the phase of the oscillator here, which means now that psi here are, uh, you know, has to decrease as we go to smaller values of x. So in other words, if we're going in this direction, then psi is going to be increasing. So what that means is, is that we flipped the sign as psi, and so psi of x in this case is going to be plus kx. Um, and then, of course, the, the constant offset doesn't matter. We can, we can call it plus phi, minus phi. It doesn't matter what this constant uh, phase offset is. So for a wave that's traveling in the negative x direction, so this is a wave that's traveling in this direction, we have our displacement in terms of x and t, t is equal to a, which is the amplitude, cosine. And now we're going to have kx plus omega t, and then plus our constant phase offset phi. So if we have these two uh, terms, the kx and the omega t, have the same sign, that means we have a wave traveling in the negative x direction. If they have opposite signs, it means we have a wave traveling in the positive x direction. And so that's how we can write down a function that describes the displacement of the medium for a wave. So we've derived now through a rather hand-wavy argument are solutions. Uh, so the question is now is what uh, equation, what differential equation are these a solution of? So here's our wave equation for a wave traveling in the positive x direction. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with taking a partial derivative of psi with respect to position. And when we do this, 
um, we're going to be differentiating our cosine term here. So we're going to get uh, a k factor out of the front. So we're going to have a times k. And of course, we get a minus sign and uh, because cosine differentiates to give a sine. And then we've got kx minus omega t plus phi, where, of course, we're treating omega t as a constant. Then we can differentiate it again. So we end up with uh, d2 psi by uh, dx squared, or I should say partial squared psi by partial x squared. And that is going to be equal to, and then minus k squared times a cosine kx um, minus omega t plus phi. And here, right, I've got the same expression that I started with. So I can write that as minus k squared times uh, psi. Now, the other thing I can do is I can take the partial derivative with respect to time. So partial psi by partial t is equal to, and here I'm going to have a minus omega comes out the front, um, but I've gone from cosine to sine, so I've got two minuses. This is going to give me plus omega a times the sine of, and now kx minus omega t plus phi, where we're treating x as a constant. And then if I differentiate it again to give partial squared psi by partial t squared, this is now going to give me when I get a minus omega coming out the front. So I get minus omega squared times a, and then cosine kx minus omega t plus phi. So I can rewrite this as minus omega squared times capital psi. So I can now combine these two uh, partial differentials because psi here is just minus 1 over omega squared times this. And it's also equal to minus uh, 1 over k squared times this. So what I can do now if I combine these two is what I'm going to end up with is that 1 over k squared times uh, partial squared psi by partial x squared is going to be equal to 1 over omega squared partial squared psi by partial t squared. Now, I can rearrange this by putting the k over onto this side. And I get uh, partial squared psi by partial x squared is equal to k squared over omega squared times partial squared psi by partial t squared. And this is just 1 over the phase velocity squared. And so what I have finally is that partial squared psi by partial x squared is equal to minus 1 over c squared times partial squared psi by partial t squared. And this is the famous wave equation. The solutions to this partial differential equation give us the functions that describe waves. And although we sort of arrived at this conclusion sort of backwards by starting with the wave functions and then deriving the wave equation, it's nevertheless, um, this is the wave equation and the solutions to this will describe all classical waves. So now we've got our one-dimensional wave equation, which was first discovered by the French mathematician d'Alembert in the one-dimensional form that we're going to be using. But it was rapidly expanded to apply to three dimensions by Euler. Now, the solutions to the wave equation are functions which describe the displacement of a medium both in, as a function of time and as a function of position. And so the, essentially, the wave equation essentially is our equation of motion for systems that exhibit waves, just like our simple harmonic oscillator uh, equation was the equation of motion for a system which described a simple harmonic oscillator. So we're going to be using um, waves in two particular situations. We're going to be looking at waves on a string, and we're also going to be looking at acoustic waves or sound waves. However, this wave equation is actually more fundamental than that, and it applies to all types of classical waves, including electromagnetic waves, and that's something we'll be discussing much later.